The photo above is a typical paint preparation setup. Beginning on the far left, one sees the grinding stone and muller with glass containers filled with linseed or walnut oil, the binding medium. In the middle, small containers hold dry pigments. Chunks of red and yellow okra can be seen in the bowl on top of the additional grinding stone next to more molestones. In the forefront, one sees tightly tied pouches filled with leftover paint. This temporary paint storage was mostly made from sheep or pig bladders. The sack would be punctured by an ivory nail and the paint squeezed out. Then the puncture would be resealed by the ivory nail. An iron nail was avoided since it could interact with the paint and alter the purity of color. According to some Renaissance art manuscripts, leftover oil paint was also placed in small porcelain containers or in seashells, which were submerged under clean water. To be used immediately the next day, the paint would be molded again to squeeze out any water remaining. A sketch by Rembrandt shows a color maker at work. Paint was made fresh daily in a well-lit area. In the early morning, the master would pre-order certain colors for his assistants to prepare. Thus, when the master arrived in the art room, all his tools, brushes, paints, and palettes would be ready for him to start the painting. It was a procedure similar to today's medical assistants preparing the operating room for the surgeon to walk in and begin the surgery. Pallets were made of wood, usually oval or square-shaped, and roughly 12 by 16 inches. In the 17th century, a systematic setup of the colors were spaced evenly along the top of the palette. White was the first color, nearest to the thumb hole. Thereafter, the arrangement was from light to dark. Several palettes were used throughout the day, each were set up according to the color formulas needed for a specific section of the painting. For instance, there would be a specific palette set up of blues, yellows, and greens for a landscape. Here we see a Dutch palette arrangement for flesh tones. Note in number seven that the cool toned charcoal black mixed with lead white was used to achieve the bluish hues of the flesh. No blue pigment was incorporated. The warm-toned blacks of ivory or bone black were avoided since, when added with white, would create a muddy brown color unsuitable for flesh tones. Palettes were kept pristine and were easy to maintain. It was the responsibility of the apprentices or personal assistants to clean them by the end of the day. Turpentine was not used. Instead, any excess paint was first scraped off, whereby most of the earth pigments would be saved for the imprimatur layer of a newly prepared canvas or panel. Flour was lightly sprinkled on top of the scraped palette to soak up the oily residue. Afterwards, it was wiped off with a clean rag and again with a damp rag until thoroughly clean. Pallets were then hung on the wall to dry. Occasionally, for maintenance purposes, the surface would be buffed with wax. 16th and 17th century painters did not work from color wheels. Early color systems, however, did exist based on the interpretation of light and optics as studied by scientists and doctors in the universities. But these studies were not considered as a scientific system of color mixing to benefit artists. The earliest known color wheel designed specifically for painters was in a 1708 hand-painted manuscript on watercolor painting. It was based from Isaac Newton's famous circular arrangement of spectral colors, which appeared in his 1704 manuscript, Optics. 
So how did a late Renaissance artist learn about color? Artists look directly to nature for the observance of color harmonies. For instance, they would notice a suitable three-color combination in lily pads on a pond. The pink blossoms would be set off by bright green leaves against dark blue water. Thus, pink, green, and blue were harmonizing colors. The colors found in the details of feathers, flowers, gemstones, and insects were observed, like the tan and pale green of a dragonfly being a suitable two-color harmony for painting drapery. Colors found in landscapes were especially noted during the vibrant spring and fall seasons, or during sunrises and sunsets. The manuscripts often would encourage painters to take walks in the countryside and to always observe nature's light and colors. This is an excellent example to better understand how 17th century color harmonies were employed. Perhaps this French artist may have noticed and incorporated all the colors found on a golden pheasant to compose his entire painting scheme. Painters would use their keen judgment by altering color harmony combinations. For instance, note the vibrant warm red velvet curtain edged in a cooler, duller pink, or how the three different yellow tones in the draperies of the two figures, ranging from a warm orange to a cooler cream, are set off by the blue garment. This judgment to alter the color harmonies to become warmer or cooler, darker or lighter, duller or brighter, formed the criteria which determined a master colorist in the 1600s. Color harmonies are evident in medieval illuminated books, and consistent color combinations can be recognized well into the 1700s, especially in costumes and draperies, which provided the opportunity for a Renaissance artist to best present the most intense colors. Notice in these two 16th century Italian paintings how the pigments were employed in the costumes. According to the charts found in many of the art manuscripts, greens harmonized well with purples, pinks, oranges, blues, reds, and yellows at various intensities and warm, cool temperatures. Blues and reds, whether vibrant or pale, was another popular combination, as was pale green with pink, light lavender, or a dark gray-violet. White complemented all colors. However, black, as a color, was usually limited to harmonize with browns, whites, earthy reds, and yellows. Note, however, to keep colors glowing in the shadowed areas, the same color, like blue, would be deepened to its darkest hue. Thus, color shades were also addressed in the art manuscripts, and being formulized, color shades can be consistently seen in every 16th and 17th century painting. Notice in this painting that, over a red okra vermilion undercoat that likely created the base for the shades of the drapery, a glaze of deep crimson color from either a lake or matter dye was applied in the deepest folds. Black, according to many of the formulas, was only added to deepen the shadows of whites, some reds, and browns. Here we see a color harmony combination throughout the woman's costume, which likely had been influenced by the European kingfisher. Another interesting approach artists had when observing nature and applying it into their concepts was the unique affecting qualities of certain plants. In Europe, the weeping wisteria was a popular ornamental shrub that was imported from Eastern Asia. Rembrandt incorporated the same droopy feeling and muted colors of the flowers into the robe of the lamenting Jeremiah. Aside from color harmonies derived from nature and full-colored glazes applied to color shades, the manuscripts also reveal 
that there were consistent color formulas. Color formulas are found in the earliest art manuscripts of the 1400s and pertain to specific paint mixing recipes and paint handling applications for specific subjects or objects. In a 1692 Dutch manuscript by Wilhelm Buers, the color formula for painting a white horse reads, and I quote, The illuminated side of the horse be painted with a mixture of white, light okra, and black, with pure white as the highlight. Light okra is recommended for the intermediate color. For the shadow, black and light okra should be mixed together with a little white. The reflection of the underbelly should mostly be of a light okra. The hooves can be painted with black, light okra, and white with a touch of vermilion. The color of the nose is the same as that of the hooves. As for the eyes, the pupil should be of bone black and the rest with umber, black, and white. There were individual color formulas for painting fruits and flowers, even a distinction between white, Spanish red, or blue grapes. The instruction for painting dark blue grapes, as in this painting, reads from the same 17th century manuscript, and I quote, One prepares them with coal black, brown, red, and lake. When they are painted well and soft, then one has, of course, to apply the dew, and in this way. Lighten them with white, and when dry, glaze them with lake and coal black or with brown lake alone. Then apply the soft heightening. In this formula, notice that blue pigment was never mentioned or employed. The cool temperature charcoal black would provide the necessary blue color when mixed with the white or red lake. While the practice of color harmonies, shades, and formulas may be laughable to some artists today, one must realize their practical purposes in the 15 and 1600s, and thus should be understood within its historic context. For instance, this standardization was necessary since assistants worked and traveled from workshop to workshop, thus the master did not have to always retrain a new employee. Another reason, color formulas were important due to the limited amount of paint pigments that the 16th and 17th century painters had to employ. Thus, to keep their colors vibrant, glowing, and highly saturated, Color formulas ensured that pigments held their original intensity without being overmixed. And finally, by knowing what specific paints were to be prepared on a daily basis, there certainly was less waste.